All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Peter Rudy here. I'm a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and I want to thank Anthony Noto, the new CEO of SoFi, for joining us here today. Thank now, you. Some of you might know Anthony. He came from SoFi. He was the former CFO of Twitter, a longtime banker in the tech space for Goldman Sachs. Um, Anthony, given all the tech companies you've worked with over the many years, what would you say makes SoFi distinct from, from all of this? Um, I think the, the number one thing that makes it so um, distinct is that it's having such a huge impact on individual consumers and not just helping them achieve a rational benefit of saving $30,000 on their student loans or um, a significant amount on their personal loans or giving them a mortgage for the first time or investment opportunities, um, but they're doing it in a way that also drives an emotional benefit. Um, if you think about the greatest brands, um, they have both a rational benefit and an emotional benefit. And when I was first called about the opportunity to join SoFi, one of the things that struck me was how passionate the member base was about the brand. And I think that's a function of a couple things. One, there's this tremendous burden around the neck of millennials from student loans. And that tremendous burden around their neck is, is stopping them from achieving financial independence, which we define as having enough money to do what you want and to achieve their ambitions. And so the company is unlocking that opportunity for them and changing the trajectory of their lives. And that's incredibly powerful. And that's what got me to be passionate about the company and one of the key reasons why I joined. Now, I know you've also worked with some fintech companies in the past when you were at Goldman and every fintech company exists on some spectrum between pure software and kind of specialty finance. Where would you kind of put SoFi on that spectrum? Yeah, technology will be the engine of our growth. At the end of the day, the innovation that we can drive in the financial services industry gives us an opportunity to develop a broad-based technology platform that allows us to reinvent the relationship with consumers, to build a membership with, relationship with them, and service their needs from their, across their entire life stage, not just in lending products, but saving, investing, paying, and protecting. And so we're focused on a job to be done that helps them get their money right um, and a number of different variables that we think will differentiate our ability to deliver that job to be done of getting their money right. Um, and that, that's very exciting. The only way we get there is through technology. The only way to make it a real membership experience to give each individual the fastest process that they could possibly have to get that value, the best selection personalized for them, the best content, the best convenience is through technology. Now, I wanna ask you in a minute about SoFi Money, which is the big first product launch you uh, oversaw when you became CEO. But I wanna start with just the lending business, which is where SoFi started. Now, in the three months since you started, we had short-term rates go up, long-term rates go up. I assume that it affects your cost of funds. There's only so much SoFi can do on the pricing side because you kind of have to beat the federal government on, on rates for student loans. So why don't you tell us how you're responding to the, the rising rate environment with SoFi? Sure, and I, I want to make sure I put the answer in context to the broader effort that we've had over the f almost four months that I've been there. Um, we established our mission, which is really critical. We think we have a huge opportunity to impact people's lives, and we want to be a mission-driven company. And so we, we formally established the mission about four weeks ago, which is to help people achieve financial independence so they can real realize their ambitions. And financial independence, we define as having enough money to do what you want. For some, that's having children. For others, it's buying a house. For some, it's retiring early. Um, and that's what we aspire to do and, and help our members get there. Um, second is we established core values that will drive the behavior that we have as a company because we want to build the, the best culture in the world. I think people gasp when I say, it's kind of crazy for you to think you can build the best culture in the world. You're this small fintech company in San Francisco. You're just in the United States. Um, but the reality is, is to have the best culture in the world, it's about leadership. You don't need capital to do it. You don't need some technology. You don't need special sauce. You need people that establish what the right behaviors are, and then they lead by example, and they hold others accountable. And so we've been able to do that. And then to answer your question directly, we established what our 2018 priorities were as a company. Mm -hmm. And our number one priority um, that we've communicated to the company and built objective and key results against is to strengthen our core loan products. And when we think about strengthening our core loan products is to make them durable through a financial and economic and employment cycle. And so that's been our focus is as rates are increasing, what, what are we doing today against all the different variables? And the way I think about it is that there's a number of different variables that allow us to, to transition through the cycle. And there will be a transition as interest rates continue to increase. Um, but we're building an economic model that allow us to, to navigate through that transition. Um, the variables that exist for us to play with are price, clearly life of loan losses and the credit boxes that we're, um, we're using to um, drive volume, uh, marketing costs and operating costs. And there are gives and takes in each one of those variables and we're really focused on making sure that we have a set of variables that allow, and plans that allow us to, to navigate the environment. Does SoFi need to have the lowest, best pricing? 
Um, we have to have the best value equation to help people get their money right. And in order to have the best value equation, we're focused on four things. And everything we do, um, whether it's a marketing decision, a pricing decision, a credit decision, a technology decision, has to reinforce one or more of those four things. And again, they're fast, being the fastest to apply, fastest to approve, fastest place to make a stock trade, pay a bill, to you know, deposit money, um, the best selection. People misunderstand selection as just a, a portfolio of products, but it's much more than that. It's using technology to personalize the products. There's an infinite permutation of different ways to create products in a world that's completely digital. Um, and so that will be the second way. And then third, uh, content broadly defined. So education content, information content, market content, and then last is convenience. We don't want to be a place where you only can uh, execute with us during a certain number of hours, where you have to go to a physical location. We want to make it convenient anytime, any place, anywhere from any device. So those are the four things that we're focused on. Price is one element within selection. Mm. You mentioned credit performance a minute ago. Um, you know, a lot of folks think we're, we're getting pretty late in the credit cycle. I know SoFi has reported some higher delinquencies in its personal loan book. Now, a lot of those decisions happened before you came aboard, but you know, you're the CEO now and kind of have to mitigate them. So why don't you walk us through how SoFi's loan performance is today and, and where you sure. can Sure. Um, you know, the, we talked about that in our, in our quarterly letter about our financial results. The team had already put into action some changes from a technical and a, um, a credit score standpoint. We've already seen improvements in those credit profiles relative to what we saw in the past, and so we're really encouraged about the near-term trends that will result in near, longer-term benefits. Um, as I mentioned before, our number one priority is to make sure that we, make the, we strengthen the core loan products. One element of that is a credit um, profile that will endure through the cycle. And so we recognize that there is a cycle and one that we have to be prepared for, and so we're putting in place the right types of credit um, methodologies to allow us to deliver value to ultimately our investors um, that are buying our loans. So beyond lending, you guys just launched SoFi Money this week. Do you want to tell the audience what SoFi Money is? Sure, um, and I think it's important to put in the context our, our approach. We want to have a, a collection of products and services where the success in one product or service drives the success in the next, and that we create a daily relationship with our members, and that everything we do is embedded in a member approach, member pricing, member credit, member experience, products that are unique for, for members. Um, and SoFi Money is the first product that really is going to allow us to have a significant daily relationship. Our wealth product has one, one asset class, which is uh, equities and robo, and there's a lot more that we'll add there. Um, but SoFi Money, in our mind, has the broadest appeal um, and an ability to have a relationship on a daily basis. Um, the reason why we call it SoFi Money is because it's, it's different than a bank account or a checking account or a savings account or even an investment account. Um, we're allowing individuals to use their mobile phone to do everything they need to do. They can pay a friend, they can pay a bill, they can withdraw cash with an ATM card, they can pay with a debit card, um, they can transfer money, they could wire money, uh, they can set up instant bill pay, they can schedule bill pay, they can deposit a check from their phone. We're going to provide a, a high interest rate for a checking account. Uh, our goal is to provide 1% interest rate if you do direct deposit with us. Um, over time, we'll add more value to the debit card um, for those that have become larger um, partners with us, that their membership will continue to draw value for them the more they do with us. Um, so it's in a beta right now. Um, we've had great success for it so far. I actually brought with me the mailer for those that signed up in the last couple of days. Um, they'll get the, um, very debit, heavy. the debit card in a very SoFi way uh, that lays out all the value and and gives them a membership card to put in their pocket. And we think of that as a membership card, not a debit card. Um, but ultimately, we want to be... That. So ultimately, we want to be the place that allows them to do all of those different activities to get their money right um, in a differentiated way. And it's one core element of everything else we'll do with them. And we'll use the data to help give them advice on discretionary spending, on savings and investing, um, and also borrowing. Now, in terms of timing, you know, you're launching a, a checking account-like product at a time when I think the, the biggest banks are increasing their market share and deposits, right? And you have a lot of tech companies from PayPal to Square to even Amazon talking about offering a checking account. So you're coming out with this product at a time when the incumbents are even stronger and when the new entrants are, are pretty you know, diverse. So what do you think is going to differentiate so fun money. Yeah, I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna be a broken record. We think there's a lot of white space mm -hmm. in making every transaction faster, every activity faster, and by using technology to do that. Uh, there's no reason it takes five or six days to approve a loan. It should take five or six seconds. There's no reason that the funds aren't available for five or six days. It should take five seconds. Uh, there's no reason that it takes us a month to do a securitization. It should take an instant to be able to do that. And so we'll continue to really, really use technology to iterate and innovate around fast. And fast applies literally to everything. 
um, and we'll do the same thing with selection and content and, uh, and convenience. Mm -hmm. So this product is a beginning, but it's in no word near an end, and we'll use technology and data to drive its innovation. Mm -hmm. um, we've been able to do the same thing in other industries, and there's a lot of white space when we talk to millennials about what they need, and at the end of the day, they have five core functions. They borrow money, they pay, they, they save, they invest, and they protect. Um, and there's, in, in our view, there's an opportunity in each one of those areas to drive those four differentiators mm -hmm. and ultimately help them get their money right. Now, the original plan with SoFi Money was to, to roll it out with a bank that SoFi had applied to open last year. Now, before you came aboard, they hit pause on that application. Just yesterday, we had the head of the FDIC come out and say that she wants to speed up approvals of bank applications, industrial loan company uh, applications, which is what SoFi applied for. Um, is there anything about the current regulatory environment that makes you think differently about whether to restart that process of applying for a bank charter? I would say there's nothing changed in the regulatory environment to cause us to rethink it. There's definitely a change in our approach and our strategy mm. that will cause us to rethink it. Um, the benefits of hi having a bank license or a another form is preemption on a state basis. Mm -hmm. We have state licenses already. Mm -hmm. That does require us to meet 50 different requirements, um, but we've built the systems to be able to do that, which we think is a core advantage. Um, having one way to do it with preemption would be better than 50 ways, um, but it's not a strategic imperative that we need to have a license in order to operate since we went down the path of more arduous path of getting state licenses. Um, and we don't have licenses in every state, and so we're slowly chipping away at additional ones, but we have it in the states that are most critical for us to scale our business, and you know, we did $12.9 billion of loan volume in 2017, which sends a pretty strong message that we've reached critical mass in state licenses, but we'll, we'll add more there as well. Um, the second is <clears throat> low cost of funds, and, and for us to be successful over time, we need to maximize lifetime value relative to customer acquisition cost and cost of funds and a ability to use deposits as a funding source is one way to have low cost of funds. But it's not the only way. Mm -hmm. There are other ways to have low cost of funds, and so we're gonna be really strategic and, and make sure that we move at a measured pace to, to make the decision on where we wanna go, but ultimately, we wanna maximize simplicity, which is preemption. Mm -hmm. We wanna maximize our ability to operate in, in other environments at a really low cost, um, but we don't necessarily wanna burden the business in ways that are unnatural to rel relative to what we're doing. And so we'll evaluate it, but we haven't made any decisions yet. Now, I wanna ask you about culture, which you mentioned a minute ago. Um, you know, before you joined last year, there was some litigation brought by former employees at the company. You know, I and others have written about some of the complaints of some of the workforce there. When you were preparing to take the job, you know, what did you kind of expect the culture to be when you arrived at SoFi? And how did that compare to how it actually was? I expected it to be an opportunity to add tremendous value to the company by building a world-class culture. Um, one of the you know, great surprises when I arrived was how committed the employee base was to SoFi as a company and their passion for where we were headed. We didn't have a stated mission at that point in time. Um, we had a target that people talked about. We've also changed that. Um, and so there were people that wanted to be part of a mission-driven company and they needed that mission to be defined and that was encouraging. Secondarily, they had already started working on some elements that would help build the foundation of what it takes to have a world-class culture. Um, they had an organization that they put together in an initiative called One SoFi, which was a collection of people across the company at different levels and um, in different uh, geographic locations that spanned different elements of diversity. Um, and the focus of that team was to define the behaviors that we as a company wanted to re the company represent. Um, and so that was a strong foundation for me to come in and work with the senior team in establishing a mission, and then the core values that at the highest level reflected all those different behaviors. So we've rolled that out to the company. Um, it's something that's being communicated every day. Having core values does not create a culture. It's a starting point, not an ending point. And so it's a constant education process. It's a constant accountability process for us as leaders to make sure that we're holding each other accountable to that. And I feel really great of what we've been able to do on the company side from a, you know, a core building standpoint in three months. Has it come on much in recruiting? I know you've had to build a pretty new executive team because a lot of departures happened. Uh, yeah, our, our, far, our first key hire and most critical hire was hiring Michelle Gill, who first and foremost um, is just a phenomenal leader and a great culture carrier. And um, I became very passionate about convincing her to join SoFi when I got to know her from when I was announced as CEO to ultimately when um, we convinced her to join, which was you know a very long selling process. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I wanted her to be part of our team and a partner to me because she's a phenomenal leader and a great culture carrier. It so happens she's also incredibly smart and a great financial mind and has a great reputation and credibility and she's already having a huge impact on our company. 
Our second key hire was a gentleman named Rich Garside, who is a 30 plus year veteran with City. Uh, he drove both technology and operations and adding him to our team takes us to another level. Um, and I couldn't be more excited about him joining the team. Um, we'll have news over the next couple of weeks of about other key hires that will really reflect um, how people see SoFi and the opportunity in front of it. And would, I think we'll continue to add just world-class talent to our already strong team that's built something that's phenomenal. I, I don't, when I, when I first got to the company and started looking at the numbers in much greater detail, and I did a lot of diligence before I got there, and then I went to the operations centers, it was just unbelievably amazing to me that this company of 1,300 people could generate and deliver $13 billion of loan volume in one year. And that's a, that's a significant number of transactions. It takes a significant amount of capital and people that are passionate and people that can operate. So we're building off a strong base, but adding this additional talent will help us in the next phase of the company's growth. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about the public markets, given your experience as an investment banker for a while. We've had a few pretty big fintech IPOs in the past couple weeks, and I know that's not probably your number one priority these days, but what, what is it about the market environment that could influence your timing on, on if the window is closing or if it's open, and just how, how you think about that? Yeah, going public is definitely not a priority. Or, you know, we have five priorities, and that's not on the list. It could get on the list over time, but for 2018, it's not on the list. We want to build the foundation of a long-term um, durable company that will create tremendous value and do something that hasn't been done in the financial services industry the way it has been in retail or, or travel, um, and that's what we're focused on. Um, I think the public markets um, will always have periods when they're closed and periods when they're open, and we'll deal with that when it becomes a priority, but until then, not really focused on it. Um, in terms of priorities for uh, corporate development, right? You've, you've done a lot of deals over your career. There's a lot of fintech companies out there, and a lot of folks have been predicting some wave of consolidation happen at some point. You know, SoFi, I think, has acquired two or three companies in its, in its history. How do you think about uh, acquisitions? What are the kind of things that you would want to, you know, buy on the outside versus build yourself or partner? Sure. If you, if you look back over the last 20 years, there's been an unbelievable amount of value created in consumer technology companies through acquisition. Um, you know, Google acquired um, YouTube, which is obviously a a stalwart in video and incredible value. Priceline acquired bookings.com, um, Expedia acquired Trip, uh, eBay acquired PayPal. Acquisitions can create tremendous value, and so we hired a head of corporate development that joined a week ago. Um, he and reports to Michelle, and they're working on a strategic framework of how we would think about prioritizing um, inorganic growth, which could accelerate our growth. We don't have any near-term plans, but we're building a strategy and a process to evaluate um, the different opportunities as they come our way. Um, I actually love the opportunity that sits in front of us as the environment becomes more challenging uh, for companies. A lot of the fintech companies that exist today are not driving huge lifetime values that support them investing in the future. They're investing in the future via VC capital raises. We have a tremendous lifetime value day one with each one of our loan and members, uh, and that's what's allowed us to invest in the future. Um, the management team at SoFi deserves a boatload of credit for the capital market strategy they've built, for the $2 billion of capital they've raised, for the $2 billion of capital we still have, for being gap profitable last year, generating free cash flow. So as the environment becomes tougher for monolithic fintech companies, um, I think it could actually get less competitive for us because of the resources we have and the resources they don't have, and that will create opportunities and we'll be very judicial as we evaluate those. But um, we won't have a, a mentality that everything has to be built internally. If there's an opportunity to accelerate our growth like some of the other stalwarts today, we'll do that. Um, just about out of time, but I uh, want to play a little game of underrated, overrated, if you're up for it, like our last panelists. Um, so I'm going to say one word, and you're going to tell me where you think it is on that spectrum. Okay. Uh, I guess first, Bitcoin. I think it's underrated. Underrated. FinTech. Definitely underrated. Twitter. Underrated. <laughs> okay. <laughs> SoFi. Underrated. Squared. <laughs> underrated squared. Goldman Sachs. Fairly rated. Fairly rated. <laughs> okay. Just for the record, I'm still a very large shareholder. Okay. Um, large for a blue collar kid from Poughkeepsie. Uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, fairly rated. Fairly rated. Okay. Um, so we have one more minute. I just want to ask, uh, since you've been there for four months now, a lot of the work that uh, you've done, some of it had predated you and kind of the, the product roadmap out there. What do you think is the stamp that Anthony Noto has put on SoFi in the four months he's been there? And if we're having this conversation in a year or two, what do you want to be remembered for uh, for your tenure at SoFi? Yeah. You're never going to hear me evaluate my own, own uh, impact. Um, 
results speak louder than words. We have a lot to do. There's a huge opportunity in front of us. I'm focused on the next five to 10 years, not the last three months. I'm really proud of the company and the people that have had the resilience to navigate through what's happened over the last year, their passion to be at the company. And it's a, it's a, privilege, uh, it's a privilege and a pleasure for me to be part of that team. Um, and if I can help everyone achieve more than they would otherwise, then I'll be really satisfied. But we have so much to do and um, there's a long road ahead of us that we're focused on making sure that we build the biggest, most successful company that we're all proud of. When I spoke to the board during the CEO selection process, um, there was a question, what would success be? And um, I have that presentation, I show it to people we're recruiting, um, I've laid out what we need to do in the first 90, the first 180 days, we're on track to do that. Um, but ultimately, that last page, what does success mean, will be the thing I, that I, I think we have to accomplish and the thing that will make me satisfied or disappointed, and I'm focused on being satisfied. Okay. Anthony, thanks for joining Thank us. You. Thanks, everybody.